So good afternoon, everybody. I have a guest with me today. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. And in case you don't know me, I'm Jenny Lee Hodgins. I'm the host of Creative Memorial Planning Group. And I'm really excited to be doing this series of interviews about death doulas. And I've, I'm featuring a death doula today who is also a Creative Memorial Planning member. And before I introduce her, I just want to you know, give you a little um, understanding of why I'm doing this. For me, this group is about making death a natural part of our lives and taking the sting out of talking about death and embracing the conversation about death as part of our normal, natural existence. And I know, you know, for the past 200 years or so, the medical and the corporate world have basically kind of made death seem like a taboo mystery and they've made it seem that they're the only people that can handle it. But the truth is that death is natural, and when you personalize it, especially well in advance, for yourself and for your loved ones, you're empowering yourself to make death an experience that is so much more meaningful and personal and, and positive for everyone. So I'm really, I just want to say thank you. I'm really grateful to you for joining this group and proud of you for tuning in to watch this uh, and to learn about this and to make death a normal, natural Thing that we can talk about because the truth is we're all going to experience and we probably some of us already have experienced the loss of and death of others that we love we're all going to go through it ourselves and yet people avoid this topic because of their superstitious beliefs or outdated fears or like i said because the medical and corporate world have kind of pushed it aside as something that they control so I'm really just trying to bring it back into the hands of ordinary people to make it natural, to make you comfortable, you know, talking about it. And to know that when somebody dies with a plan in place, the suffering for surviving loved ones is cut in half. And I found too that by when you face life and death with courage, you know, facing things that are a little bit difficult, your whole experience is enriched and empowered. And one way to do that is to think about it and talk about it more and about anything that causes angst, but especially death. And so that's why I'm addressing this. And one of the things that I do is, um, you know, recently I've invited some of my creative memorial planning group guests who happen to be death doulas. I've been inviting them to talk with me so that I can share with you. What is a death doula? What's the benefit of having that in your end of life plan? And how does that bring peace of mind to yourself and your loved ones? So I'm really glad that you're joining me. And I want to, uh, today as part of my series about death doulas, I want to um, introduce and welcome my guest who's sitting here very patiently <laughs> waiting for me. She's a creative memorial planning group member. She's an end of life doula and a death educator, and she's founder of Last Wishes Consulting. So I just want to say welcome, Leslie James. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for that warm welcome, uh, Jenny. Uh, I, may I share a bit of my backstory or a little bit of history of how I got into uh, this role? Uh, first of all, I have almost 30 years um, in my, the corporate world uh, working for a healthcare company and in various roles, but always in customer service, training, and admin, and planning is part of that. Um, doula, the word doula is a Greek term that means helper or server. And I feel that even though I, I, I don't have any, like I don't have a nursing background, I don't have a medical degree, I don't have a social worker degree, uh, you know, I, um, it's innate in me to want to help someone. Um, that's the way I've just always performed uh, in my uh, work life. And um, during my uh, corporate career, I uh, was involved in assisting two dear friends and their families through their end of life journeys. Uh, one was a dear friend um, that I used to play tennis with. And in uh, 2016, uh, sadly, uh, it was just before Christmas, uh, she passed. So it was very emotional. Mm -hmm. I'm still in touch with her. Well, her daughter was a teenager at the time, but I'm still in touch with her uh, four years later. It's coming up uh, four years. And then... Wow. In um, 2018, uh, January, it's probably the coldest winter we had, uh, my other dear friend, uh, he 
passed away. And uh, again, Sorry. just it was an honor to do bedside vigiling and uh, support the family, provide emotional support, uh, practical support, some education, and uh, you know, teenage daughters again. And I'm still in touch with uh, their their families. So it's was definitely learned my own grief, um, right. but. I started, these were such profound incidences, in addition to other relatives and family members, you know, my, both my grandmothers, my mother-in-law, but these two, I think because they were my age, mm. uh, so I'm 53, and at the time, uh, my one friend was 49, and the other was 51, and that's uh, mm. fairly young, and I just mm. found it was such a stressful um, f- uh, f- you know, event for the families uh, dealing with, uh, you know, what to do, where to go. Uh, it was just a very overwhelming and daunting uh, process. And right. I, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, I think they were thankful for my presence. And I was uh, very honored to do readings at both their funerals. And, um, you know, what I did was I started researching and I realized that I was uh, an end-of-life doula before I even knew <laughs> there was a term. So I took some courses towards the end of last year I, with doula givers. I took a peace of mind planner. I've taken some with Willow uh, end of life in uh, Western Canada. And then I registered for an end-of-life uh, course with Douglas College in uh, B- BC, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, again, Everything was shifted with COVID. It was supposed to be an in-person. We still had a facilitator. She was lovely. And we had a great group of about 16 of us. It was switched to online. But it was just such great learnings. Um, And I feel like it's just been a calling that I've had to answer. And I'm I'm so thrilled. You know, I'm following. This is going to fill my heart, being able to help others in this way. I just really resonate with you. I can just feel the compassion oozing out of you. <laughs> so, you know, if I if I were to, you know, have a, a death doula at the end of my life plan, I would pick you <laughs> because you just have a warmth about you. And I think that is what is really necessary, you know, for being a death doula to bring that kind of comfort to the people. And I want to say too, before we go any further, um, for those of the, that are watching, you know, please drop questions in the comments or plop in a hashtag aha if anything that Leslie or myself are saying something in today's presentation that resonates with you or share your experiences or um, if you have questions or anything that you want to ask, feel free to do that. And even if um, we don't catch it now, we'll be continuing to monitor it. And I'm sure Leslie will answer any questions as well as I as we go on. I wanted to um, bring it back to as when I met Leslie, I asked her what her contribution to the topic of end of life experience would be. And she said, quote, I feel that knowledge is power. I'm continually learning about all aspects of death and dying. So I can transfer this knowledge to others. I thrive in being in a supportive role and believe people can have a better dying experience with some thoughtful preparation, assistance with planning, and based on informed decisions. One of my goals is to help take the stress out of death for the dying person and their loved ones. Think of me as your empathetic liaison supporting end of life, end quote. So I love that because it really does speak to your personality, really does shine with this really nurturing, kind compassion. I love that about you. That's why I really resonate with you. And I know your company, Last Wishes Consulting, just to be clear so that people understand, it's not, it doesn't offer medical, financial, legal, or funeral services or advice. You provide valuable consulting, education, guidance, emotional, and practical support. So I wanted to ask you maybe to share with the audience, what do you think the benefits of including your services as an end-of-life doula as part of their care team what would that do to help take the stress from the dying or from surviving loved ones? That's a big question. <laughs> Great question. No, I, I um, definitely from the emotional, educational, and practical support, uh, that's definitely my forte. Uh, you know, there's spiritual support that I can provide. It's, it's holistic support, making the family feel comfortable. Tell us where you are so that people know where your services are available. Yeah, 
I am in, uh, so I live in Markham, Ontario, which is just north of Toronto, Ontario. I, you know, just because of the differences, um, I will just be focused on Ontario, uh, mainly York region, uh, but just certain, you know, right. north of the greater Toronto area. COVID hit and my situation, I also have an autoimmune uh, disorder. Oh, so goodness. I'm not at this point going to be doing any in-person, um, you know, I've had to pivot basically right, right. right now until this pandemic is is over i feel i can still be an incredible assistance and and a lot of doulas are switching to tele doulas you know right, right. and you know the education piece mm-hmm. and we can still have these these uncomfortable conversations i can invite people to open up and they may not want to be comfortable talking about it with a next of kin or a loved one initially right. but i can help uh open up that conversation uh, clearly demonstrate why it's important. Let's back up a little bit too. And I know right now the pandemic has really put a wrench in a lot of people's plans. And so describe if someone wanted to have you as a death doula now during the pandemic, how would you function through this kind of video conferencing for the dying and the loved one? What would that look like? Can you paint us a picture? Yes. So uh, all my services are re- remote, uh, but I can do, wow, you know, uh, phone calls, any other way, you know, WhatsApp, Messenger, whatever uh, is comfortable for the individual. And uh, I will, um, you know, I'm all about, you know, a deaf literate uh, community uh, talking about, okay, what's important to you? It's, it's, it's having these discussions and uh, conversations, uh, documenting them, what is what does what do you envision uh, when your end of life uh, comes as far as after death care? Mm-hmm. I've learned a lot uh, in myself and educating people that you don't you know hospi- our health care system is so strained. I mean, kudos yeah. to all our professional yeah. doctors, palliative care doctors, nurses, right. frontline workers, um, but they have taken an oath to save a person's life and that's great if a person is sick and they need treatment yes a hospital is the place um however if it comes to end you know a person's in their 90s and not to say 90s is old, you know people my grandmother lived to 100 but wow that's amazing. if they are you know if it comes to a situation where you know maybe a hospice is a better a situation or maybe you know you could not you could certainly have the option to um spend your final hours or days at home with loved right. ones around you especially right. with covid now and you're not able to have loved right. ones come to the facility you don't need to call a funeral director right away you know thank you i for see death that. as yeah. very sacred yes there's people who've been through trauma and it's a very emotional time. People are mourning and breathing, and but you can spend that time and just be with the um, person who has died. Um, you can have, if there's rituals in your culture or your religion, you can perform those. Um, you can help to cleanse the body, dress the body. Um, there's so many uh, things that you can do, and I think that helps with the closure as well. I think that's so important that you brought that up. And I've mentioned that in some of my other lives that, you know, the abruptness and the kind of sterility and the kind of impersonal way that corporate just yanks the deceased out as soon as possible. You don't have to do that. You can be, like you're saying, when someone passes away in their home, first of all, if they're in the hospital and they're on their dying days, like my dad had cancer, um, Mm -hmm. he spent a long, hard battle in the hospital and he wanted to be home. So we brought him home at that, at that point he had hospice. If I'd known about death doulas, then I would have incorporated that because as soon as he was, you know, gone, the, as soon as that hospice person reported that to, you know, the funeral director, you know, the funeral corporate world likes to get the body out of there really quickly and using a death doula, you don't have to do that. You could, my father could have stayed in home in place at a much more gentle, slower pace of time for all of the family members to really 
acknowledge without the shock. I mean, it's shocking anyway when you lose someone, but having them in the home, in, in your own pace, in the family, surrounded by the loved ones, that to me is what the death doula can kind of help with, particularly if like, because I'm not a death doula. So, you know, if that situation happens, as you may know, I'm the caregiver for my mom. And if she were to go, I wouldn't want to serve as her death doula. I would be overcome by my own grief. I'm just going to be blunt. <laughs> so I would want some someone like you to, even if it's in the middle of the pandemic, to maybe meet with me like this and kind of guide me on what can I do to kind of calm the situation and spend the last moments, you know, if she's already passed away, what do I do in the interim between transferring her body to whatever means of handling the remains we've decided on? Can you speak to like, how would that, what would that scenario look like if you were involved? How do you help the family once the person is gone? You know, I know we haven't talked a little bit about, we talked about preparing and having a plan, but what if they, you know, they're, they're already gone. What, what would a death doula function be in that situation for the surviving loved ones? First of all, even if, even if a doula in Canada was present at the time of death, we are not legally allowed to touch the body once the body has, um, is once the person has died. Yeah. So that, that's different in different areas too. So a person has died. We can, we, even if I was in the room, I can guide the family. If it was, you know, a shrouding them or whatever, I can guide them, but I can't touch the body. So it's the same thing. We can use a technology to do that. But the family can. You can teach them how to shroud the, the dying. Yes, yes. And, you know, there could be uh, certain rituals. I mean, if a person <clears throat> had written down, maybe there's certain scents, uh, certain oils, or certain, you know, I mean, the, before they, I know you're talking about the past, but okay. the last thing to go is the, the hearing. Yes. So, you know, is there certain music or certain sounds? Uh, do they want the um, windows open, you know, sunlight coming through, uh, natural light, uh, or, you know, there's just, what would your loved one want? That's what it comes down to. Um, they are still, you know, it's very sacred. We want to respect that. We want to handle the body with dignity. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And now I, I just for my audience sake, I touched on this a little bit with another interview, but basically, and I'm thinking of it for myself as well. I'm single. I don't have children. I may not ever get married. We'll see. <laughs> um, but let's say I'm planning for 20 or 30 years or whatever in advance for my end of life plan. And I want to incorporate a death doula in my end of life plans. Just, I just want people to know all you have to do is write it down. You know, make sure that your family knows this is what you want. And then in your case, you're in Toronto and Canada. So anyone there, you're a resource. They could list you so that loved ones know exactly how to, you know, contact you. And obviously they can also contact you well in advance to do a similar service that I do and prepare in advance for something. But I just want people to know that they can plan in advance. It doesn't have to, you don't have to not think about having a death doula unless it's the very end of your life or you don't have to wait to think about it when you're really ill and you're on your deathbed. This is something you can incorporate as a plan B, you know, like in your, in your end of life plans so that you have an easy transition basically. What does a death doula need to know about to help people? Anything from the spiritual aspect to, about grief, about hospice, about laws in Canada, about um, you know bereavement support, um, and the dying process. What uh, what are the indications? You know, pain and symptom management, infection control. There is a whole uh, spectrum of you know, the full breadth of, you know, anything to do with uh, death and dying. Uh, and the other thing is um, advocacy, you know, just like, you, you know, I had never heard about a, a death doula or end of life doula. You, many people have not. Right. And our job is to advocate for maybe better hospice care and palliative care. There's been studies yes. done that uh, a person actually, um, it does better and the loved ones have a better outcome if the person is in hospice or at home. There's yes. been studies done on this yes. than being in the hospital. 
uh, not only that, I mean, not, not everything is about money, but it actually is um, more cost effective. It, it, mm -hmm. And with all the, sometimes the patient actually lives longer, not in not every case, but right. there, there are studies uh, that um, speak to this. You know, so, I just I just read a study about read something about that recently where and it was exactly that that the research had proven that people who were um, home with uh, personal care versus people in the hospital or even in the hospital and having personal care coming in that extends their life and their longevity and their quality of life. And I think it home is a big difference because you feel comfortable in your own surroundings you know, with your loved ones. I think that makes just a mental shift for the, you know, the person on their deathbed. But I think that to me, it speaks volumes about what the benefits of a death doula would be in regard to bringing that personal touch that goes back to, I just feel the vibes coming off of you, that, you know, that you would be such a caring person to have by the side of the dying or for the surviving loved ones and to walk them through that. You know, when you're, when you're dying or when you're watching someone die that you care about, it's overwhelming that, you know, the emotional aspect of it. And to have someone there that's not personally that connected and yet very personal about the attention they're giving, I just think this is an incredible alternative to the corporate traditional way that really can bring so much peace of mind to people. And what you just said is that research actually shows that that makes an impact on the quality of the end of life and even promoting that life, the longevity a little bit. That's amazing to me. It, it is. Like, it's, it's fascinating. It's uh, so interesting. And it, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. So it is. In, in addition to that, doulas, we, you know, it's all about supporting uh, the loved one, the family choices. We trust, you know, right now I'm um, building relationships, uh, doing education sessions to get people aware and to be able to, who is Leslie James, right? And trust me, uh, before I can help them with such a very personal and sensitive um, moment okay. in their life, right. 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 we answer phone calls, we answer um, you know questions. We will hold space. We will hold privacy. Uh, we will hold their hand. So if I, if I was it. able to do that, the spiritual aspect of a death doula. How do you approach that? with a family? What do you mean by spiritual practices? Sure, and I'm uh, learning about different, uh, different religions, and uh, I've also be att been attending uh, different uh, sessions that I can, uh, that are speaking to different cultural uh, differences, so that I become, can become more um, aware of the spiritual differences. I would be comfortable reading a passage from the Bible. If someone has wants another passage read from somewhere else, I could do that. If they have uh, other rituals, um, and that's why I would speak with the family ahead of time uh, to learn what's important to them. It's all about being um, aware of the different uh, spiritual practices and rituals that are available. And um, from an, another point of view, I'm also part of different associations and affiliations. And uh, there's the Death Doula Ontario Network. There's also the okay. End of Life Doula Association of Canada. And so we're going to be doing yeah. a book study um, on, you know, a grief support from September to December. I'm also a member of the Bereavement Ontario Network. So, so it's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Beautiful. there's probably a dozen different organizations that I am uh, part of that I, you know, seeking mind and learning. How would you, um, in terms of, um, ber um, for, first of all, thank you for sharing that, because basically what I'm hearing is that as a death doula, in terms of the spiritual practice of you, you basically let the dying one's wishes guide you in what you would do and the, and the surviving loved one's wishes and making everyone feel at home with you, the use of spiritual practices that are in sync with their personal values, basically. And when you're talking about bereavement services and learn in that book, uh, you know, go, basically guiding people through the grieving process and, and learning about that, how would a death doula, um, help the surviving loved ones after the person's gone, 
how would you bring in the um, the topic of grief, handling the grief? Is there anything you would do on that topic for the surviving loved ones? I find very successful method of handling uh, grief, and I've done this too for uh, my loved ones who have passed, is uh, love letters that can mm, be written beautiful. after, you know, you can write a letter to your loved one. Maybe someone may not have been present at the time, but um, you can certainly get your feelings out, put it on paper. Some people like to journal. Some people like to incorporate art, be with nature, just grounding activities. There could be meditation. I listen, I have a Calm app on my phone, you know, mindfulness. There's, there's a ton of different um, uh, practices, practices, yes, yeah. yes, that can be incorporated into the grief journey, and everyone is different. You know, I've right. come across, um, you know, I'm very emotional. Up, fr you know, at the beginning, and I remember when my friend, I didn't leave the house for two weeks. It was not healthy. Mm. But I realized and I, I, I sought counseling and, you know, I got through it. I felt like I'd gone into a rock and, uh, you know, but yeah. I, I'm, right. it's, it's good. And so talk about it and say their name. Love uh, that. Talk about them. Share the memories. Share the connections. Share the memories. Yeah. yeah. So everyone's journey is hard. And then you hear about maybe an individual that didn't seem to grieve or it's, you know, maybe internalized it uh, and then. 15, 20 years later, something just, Triggers you know, it. opened yeah. up and then they're just very emotional. So yeah. we are all to, I think, just to realize yeah. that grief is such an individual. It is. And there's no two that are the same. Yeah. And it is just to use the words to support the individual. That's so beautiful. To make suggestions. Yeah. Why don't you try that? You know, we're not right. there to fix the problem. Mm. It's to accept it to acknowledge that you will be grieving and to uh you know perhaps make some suggestions on what may or may not work oh thank you for sharing this is really heartwarming to me and it reminds me i i'm a, actually i'm an sgi buddhist practitioner so i've practiced buddhism for 34 years and one of the stories in the buddhist teachings is um uh, a woman who had lost her child is just grieving and um, horribly upset and the the original Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha uh, Prince Gautama whatever he comes to her and says go to um, go through the community and um, collect three um, mustard seeds from three people who have not experienced this loss and then I will show you how to get over this because she's just like show me how to get over this pain I'm so she goes and through her journey she discovers that there's not one person who has not been affected by some kind of a loss. And she aware, became aware through that, that she was not alone, that this is part of a, a life experience that everyone has. And so I found that to be really incredible. And then she sat down and, you know, was kind of crying her grief out. And the Buddha came back and sat next to her and said nothing and just sat there with her for a yeah. long time. And I think what you've, what you've described is it, that just reminded me that because some people need silence. Some people need, you know, explanation. Um, some people need to cry it out. Some people need to write about it. Um, my family, we're very ridiculously uh, artistic and expressive. So Love that. <laughs> send some my way, please. <laughs> well, so like my dad's memorial, he, he had a memorial service you know, they didn't know about these alternatives then. So we, we did something within his church, which was important to my dad and my mom. And he had a role for each one of us. And so, you know, for example, I played classical music, Claire de Lune by Debussy. That was my dad's favorite piece. My sister played Danny Boy on the flute and I accompanied her and I accompanied her on the piano on different songs like, um, sunrise sunset you know musical things that my dad loved um my other sister i helped her record her voice singing the beatles song um in my life which really for her expressed her feeling about my dad but she wasn't comfortable performing it so we recorded it behind the scenes and then her daughter sang amazing grace acapella it was like oh. this cultural amazing like <laughs> celebration for my dad and then each one of us gave a eulogy so we're all like speakers and poets and musicians and that's not for everybody but i'm just saying 
um, sometimes just sharing a poem, finding a poem that speaks to you is one way that you can deal with grief. So I, I, sorry, I just went on about that, but I just resonate with your idea that you can help people through the grieving process by not fixing it, but by allowing people to be themselves and choose what works for them. But Jenny, thank you for sharing. And, and how long ago was it that your dad? My dad passed away January 2014, which is why I'm up here now with my mom. <laughs> right. So my, you know, belated condolences. But uh, yeah, it, you know, this never, you know, I'm, I love that you, you know, arranged it and you all had such uh, a very intimate part in his uh, memorial. We did. And, and my condolences to you, too, on your friends. A, a good friend of mine passed away two years ago, right before her 50th birthday. And I did her memorial as well. And it, it does really bring that point home that age means nothing in, in terms of death. It can come at any moment. So one of the alternatives that I've talked about in my group, alternatives to traditional funeral plans, besides the use of a death doula, is how people can choose more earth-friendly, green kind of options to handle the remains. And you had shared with me that in Ontario, in Canada, which, by the way, my father's ancestors came through from Ireland through Winnipeg, Manitoba, to Pennsylvania and Kentucky. That's where I'm from on my dad's side. <laughs> so I feel a connection with the Canada thing there. Um, but in Canada, you, you shared with me that they have eco-friendly solutions, green burials, and this fairly new, um, more earth-friendly cremation option called, we call it... Um, uh, aquamation or alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation. And I've talked about that very little. There's, there are about 18 states in America that use that um, uh, more earth-friendly cremation process. Um, and I've talked about using biodegradable urns and amendable kits if you want to bury the ashes so that they're plant-friendly. And I've talked a little bit about burying cremains, you know, in an earth-friendly way and natural burials and even starting a natural burial site can be done uh, depending on where you live in America. And those, for anybody interested in some of those ideas, it's in the units section in the Creative Memorial Planning Group. And hit me a, send me a DM if you can't find it, I'll help you. But, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because I know that water cremation or aquamation is really the most earth friendly choice other than just a natural burial, really, for handling remains. What do you know about? aquamation i know i don't know as much as i'd like to and how available is aquamation in canada not every province in canada has this the aquamation is uh first of all one twelfth of the environmental impact exactly uh, as far as a, a using a pollution cremation i guess the scientific word is alkaline hydro hydrolysis mm -hmm. um it is a water cremation or flameless cremation and the body is put into a, I would say, a stainless steel tank. Um, so, and it's nothing, no clothing, no shroud, the body. Um, and it is with water. And I think they add a, a, a potassium. Anyway, they add a, right. Chemical uh, something to the reaction. water. Right. And um, I'm not. That's my medical. I'm not a scientist, here, but uh, <laughs> so they'll add uh, something to the water. But the the water is at a very high temperature, just like similar to how a flame would be at a high temperature. But the water um, dissolves all the tissue, uh, and the, I've actually seen it on a video, and I'll send it to you after the bone. Yeah, but what's yeah. you know after the process and the the affluent is drained, the bones um, of the remains they're actually quite sterile and white like you would like they're so clean from this process mm -hmm. so they would still need to be you know uh going through a mechanical process for a as as done with a cremation to get the the ashes so it's more like coarse sand but it's a whiter sand right, right. it's a whiter sand and i've heard that it's actually more uh the volume of of the cremains is more yeah. Uh, afterwards, but so it's from an environmental mm -hmm. impact, and I think that a cost uh, it's more cost effective. Uh, but it's just got to get you know uh, more people need to have to do it, it available. For example. Right. Right. Yeah. Some families want to take the affluent, like the liquid, 
home uh, and farmers want it for their field, their vegetation mm. and their fields. It's very rich. And Cause it's compost. And yeah. It's nutrients. And know? it's, it's it, one of the most earth friendly options there are. It just needs to be more available. I just, through my own research, the aquamation or the, alkaline hydrolysis process one of the larger companies that promotes and creates the machine the machines are what's expensive to make it that that's why it's not everywhere yet partly i guess besides laws and bureaucracy <laughs> but um but they have one of the largest worldwide you know uh, uh, companies that make these machines for this process so i'm it's definitely available in australia and like i said 18 states in america but um oh, such a such a natural, um, much more natural process. And you were talking about people having these weird, um, you know, not weird, I should say, um, fears based on, not really based on logic. Like I was talking to one of my clients and she's, she described that she was afraid of cremation because of she's afraid of being burned in the fire. And I explained, well, for, for regular direct cremation, first of all, you don't feel anything, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another person that's afraid of being buried in a casket, you know, just the claustrophobic part of it. These are all kind of, that's what I mean, they're, they're kind of not based in logic. And when you really talk it through, you realize these are things not to fear because you're already gone. You don't have to fear. You just have to choose what syncs with your values, you know, for the most part. I think I'm glad we talked about that. Just to kind of help people understand that that's an availability of, a, of an option for dealing with handling the remains. And it truly is far more earth friendly, even than what most people think of as cremation. It's, it's less um, pollution. It's less toxic to the environment. It's, it, the, the breakdown of all this stuff is just... It, it, it's um it's more natural and it works with the earth if you planted it you know the uh, remains once you convert it into ashes when you when you bury it it's just it breaks down like rapidly quickly as opposed to like a natural burial. How would you be involved like if there was a a green burial or an, well let me just clarify first a green burial for those who don't know is using caskets as you would for a normal burial, but the caskets and the materials in the caskets are typically, um, they're not toxic to the, to the earth. A natural burial is forget the casket or, or, or have a casket that is made of natural materials such as bamboo or seaweed or you know cotton or putting someone in a shroud and burying them. That's a natural burial. And so what would you, as a death doula, how would you be involved, let's say for, um, would you be involved for a natural burial if someone wanted to be placed in a shroud and buried, for, for, for example, on a, if they had a rural property, it's legal to do that in the States, if you have a rural property, or if there's a cemetery for natural burials or a natural burial site, how would you be involved with that in the family for a natural burial as a death doula? Is there any involvement there? What I would like to say, Jenny, is that uh, what I've learned from joining the Ontario network of death doulas is that, I mean, there's over, there's probably hundreds of doulas just in Ontario. Mm -hmm. That's we wonderful. Are, we're like a family. We don't, I don't see us as being competitive. Mm -hmm. If I know that there's a doula that that's her, his or her specialty, um, you know, oh, okay. that's her area of specialty. I would say, okay, you know, hand off. Okay, this person oh, gotcha. is yeah. more suited to that. Or especially when you talked about the spiritual, there is uh, an individual who's, you know, uh, in the healing and Reiki. And, you know, okay. if that's what something's looking for, someone's looking for, and I don't have that uh, area of focus, I will certainly introduce another doula if it's appropriate. Um, but, you know, I just want yeah. the client to be comfortable and get what they want. I love that you're pointing that out, that, and that's what I've discovered too, just talking with the several death doulas that I've spoken with, is that death doulas are very individualized, just as each dying experience that they work with is very unique and individualized. So I, I like that you're showing that scenario. And, and yes, during the pandemic, particularly since you have an immune compromised scenario you don't want to actually be there right now for that situation like me you quote encourage having the conversation on making an advanced life plan care you know advanced yes. care plan when you're healthy now so that the care received at the end of life is appropriate and aligned with your last wishes this is a quote from you and and i know um 
what you just described is similar to what I do with my one-on-one clients through my explore, choose, and plan your creative memorial program. Well, you know, like one of my program aspects is to work with clients to create their life story, like an obituary, for example, as well as I help them prepare messages for their surviving loved ones. And I know that you do something like that. So tell us about your remote services in regard to legacy projects and, and, you know, what do you do in regard of, to legacy for the dying person and or their families. Can you tell us what that's all about? Clients who might have a a disability. Uh, I currently volunteer with CNIB, which is uh, Canadian National Institute for the Blind. So some of potentially some of my clients uh, may may be blind or hearing impaired or um, not, you know, have ALS or not able to to write. So if they uh, want to write their own obituary, I can certainly help facilitate that, um, guide them through it and actually uh, write it and read it back to them and have it all documented. Um, The other legacy is, um, you know, everybody's about pictures and videos and hearing our voice. If there's a, a message that they want to leave, I will work with, you know, we have the technology here to record a Zoom message for an individual um, with a video, audio, I could help with scrapbooking, you know, digital memories. And there's an exciting, um, you know, um, pilot coming up that I've been invited to to attend. So that's, that's coming soon. Um, What's the pilot? We're piloting that in in, uh, September and that specifically has to do with uh, Capturing digital memories. Nice. Yeah. Love that. And okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things. And I know that, you know, as the deaf education movement is growing and we're, you know, including interest in alternatives to corporate traditional funeral plans and incorporating death doulas within the dying experience, what do you feel we need to do toward empowering others about the topic of death? My philosophy is, is, um, educating the general public, the community, you know, let's get back to what we were a hundred years ago, whereas, you know, bring it, bring death back to the home. You know, it used to be the generations, you know, the, the elders, you know, the wisdom is shared on carrying, you know, that sacred practice that, you know, the passage, the journey of your loved one and, um, you know, get away from that clinical aspect. Um, and, and no offense, you know, the healthcare definitely they're the regulated uh, side, and the the funeral cemeteries is regulated. I see the you know death companions or death doulas, end of life doulas in the center. We are mm-hmm. the bridge between the healthcare and the death care, from the dying to the death process, and we just embrace that, empower that, and what my uh, business, uh, Last Wishes Consulting. Um, I believe strongly in education. Right. So I've been uh, hosting uh, an education series, which I've called Demystifying Death and Dying. And I've had two of those, uh, July, early August. I'm going to be having another two uh, at the end of this month. So on August 21st and August 27th. So my, it's all on my website. Hopefully each month I can set up, you know, say if it's the Canadian Cancer Society or ALS or Alzheimer's Society, whatever the, you know, March of Dimes, uh, cystic fibrosis, I'm not sure, you know, rare diseases. I want to uh, contact those organizations and provide on a monthly basis to a different one free um, education on what a death doula is so that they can pass it all down to their members or their uh, patients you know their families right right. so that's where i'm hoping to create the empowerment you know we've got a you know my death literacy is that is people need to be our you know we live in a death phobic uh society and i'm hoping to change that you and me both i love what you're doing that's incredible that's very vast too (laughs) just from the audience to know a little more about you, Leslie James, this has been incredibly educational and and heartwarming for me and and encouraging for me. And and I just want my audience to know that a little bit about your business. I know that it provide you provide remote services 
that are inclusive for vulnerable individuals, such as people living with disabilities, chronic life-threatening and terminal illnesses, people experiencing homelessness, and you mentioned earlier the, the Can Canadian National something blind, what was it? Yes, Canadian National Institute of the Blind. Institute of Blind, and you also um, uh, work, have things available for dementia patients and seniors. Can you describe, that's a lot. I mean, can you describe what you provide through these remote services for these kinds of um, demographics? Sure. Uh, well, having a rare disease myself, I, I am uh, part of many support groups, mostly on Facebook, but I uh, do, you know, volunteer uh, and listen in to what's, uh, you know, about different rare diseases. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of um, giving back this role of an end of life doula or death doula uh, education consulting. Yes, it's a business, but it's going to fill my heart first. Yeah, you're serving. Uh, you know, it is a deep, deep topic, but I've, I've met remotely so many doulas from across Canada and the States and Australia and the UK. And I'm having the pleasure yeah. of meeting you, yeah. Jenny. And, um, Thank you. you know, I might be reaching out to you on your creative memorial services. You know I've been following. I'm one of your <laughs> biggest fans, I think. <laughs> so well, I love it. Uh, your, your energy. When I listen you. to you, you know, you're out there doing your walk and you know, I can, I just get inspired from you. So I, I, I'm glad. I hope I inspire more people to get outside right now because this pandemic has really affected people, you know, mentally it's hard sometimes. So, and emotionally, so getting out there, it's really a joy to have you here because you really do have an incredibly deep compassionate spirit and I think your services as a death doula and all the educational things you're doing to empower people around this topic of the death experience is it's just you definitely have a mission and a purpose and and I know that you you provide your services primarily within Ontario you said the York region Durham Alton Peel and Toronto and like I said we'll plop these links in the comments and again if if my audience has any questions do not hesitate to plop those in the comments as well let's get a dialogue going and let's get this death talk out in the open and get it you know get people to learn about this and and empower each other through the conversation that I want to wrap up with our interview today with this is has been an amazing chat with Leslie James end of life doula death educator and founder of last wishes consulting it's been a really enlightening and kind of fun conversation learning from you and I really hope that this inspires everybody listening to include a death doula within their end of life plans and if you're in Ontario York region Durham Halton Peel or Toronto I hope you'll reach out to Leslie James using the links we're gonna plop in the comments below and I just want to say thank you again Leslie for joining today Thank you so much, uh, Jenny, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Back at you. So everybody, thank you for tuning in. Please squash those reactions icons for me so that the Facebook gods shower me with love and invite anybody you know to join this creative memorial planning group so we can spread this message and get death as a normal, natural part of our conversation and so that we can live a more enriched, powerful life and fully, mindfully, you know, because we're able to talk about it. So again, thank you, Leslie James, for this amazing educational chat and helpful info. And have a wonderful day, everybody.